All right, welcome everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. I'm Zen Garcia, I'm the host, and I'm stepping in for the hijacker. Uh, this is the dark side of purgatory, and this is a Saturday evening, 10 to p.m. to midnight show, and I'm honored to have a special guest with me, many top-notch researchers. Uh, we have Robbie Davison, Celebrate Truth. Robbie, are you there, brother? Yes, sorry, I actually just had uh, you on mute. Uh, thanks so much, Zen, for having me on. I'm looking forward to the show. Uh, great honor. And we also have uh, Rob Skiba with us. Rob, are you there, brother? Yes, sir. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Excellent. And Pastor Nate Wolf. Pastor Wolf, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Appreciate it. Excellent. And Nathan Thompson. Brother Nathan, are you there? Okay, maybe he did not join us yet, but I, I will try to get him back on with us. He's, um, he might just be running a little bit late, but uh, I do appreciate you guys taking the time to join us. Uh, we're just going to have a roundtable discussion. Um, those that do not know, uh, all these guys are heavy hitters in the flat earth and the biblical cosmology uh, with regard to bringing forth the truth of you know, basically how we've been deceived, brainwashed, indoctrinated into believing that the Earth is a ball and that the um, we're one of nine planets spinning in orbit around the sun. And uh, we'll talk about the reasons for such deception. And I know that this is still a new topic and a new subject of interest, especially for a lot of people on uh, Revolution Radio, and so Robbie was the host and also the organizer for what was the past two International Flat Earth Conferences, which drummed up a lot of interest and brought forth a lot of media inquiry with regard to this particular topic. And so if you would, Robbie, can you give out your website contact information and then let's talk a little bit about that since all of us were part of the the past uh, conference in November 14th and 15th. Sure. Sure. Thanks, Ann. Um, yeah. My uh, YouTube channel is Celebrate Truth and my website is CelebrateTruth.org. There you can find the documentaries I've done and then my recently uh, brand new first uh, book ever uh, released, I think about three months ago, is on there now and it's available at CelebrateTruth.org. So, but again, all my content is on uh, YouTube with Celebrate Truth. Also, I do the uh, Flat Earth International Conference and uh, you can find out more information about last year's conference at FE 2018 or next year's coming up uh, for Canada and the USA at FE2019.com. Excellent. And um, Rob, do you want to give out your website and contact information as well? And we'll just go through the formals here and then we'll go into discussion on the, the convention and kind of the topics that we all talked about and uh, the roundtables and stuff. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I've got a lot of websites, so I created one to be like the hub to get you to everything else. So you can go to robschannel.com and you can get to pretty much everything else from there. Excellent. Pastor Wolf, any contact or any information that you'd like to share? And if also, if you would, just go into a little bit about your story and how it was that you ended up uh, joining uh, the convention and also what has now made you kind of stand up for this truth. Sure. Well, I have my YouTube channel, which is Fired for Truth. That's Fired, F-O-R, Truth. I'm working on a website. I don't have that up yet, but uh, hopefully in the next several weeks, I'll be able to give a link for that. And uh, I had been, uh, just real briefly, I had been studying about uh, flat earth, biblical creation for about a year and a half up to August of this past summer. And my wife had come across an advertisement for the Take on the World 18 conference in Vermilion, Ohio. And we found out that we were just a little over an hour away. So we decided to go to it. Uh, never been to any truth conferences. Uh, didn't really know what to expect, but saw that there were a lot of big names uh, speaking. Uh, folks that we have been watching their you know, YouTube videos for months and months. And we went and we were just blown away uh, by the atmosphere, the people, uh, the content and the speakers. 
And we just both, my wife and I both felt in our guts that we needed to do something uh, to not just be taking information in, but maybe seek out and pray about uh, if the Lord would have us to do something, you know, specific to outreach, teaching, that sort of thing. So we were praying pretty fervently about it for a few weeks after that conference. And then I got a text message out of the blue one morning on a Friday uh, from one of my elders at the church uh, where I had ministered at for about seven years. And it said, you're meeting with the elders uh, in an hour at the building. So I was like, well, that doesn't sound like a party. You know, that sounds like a bad deal. So uh, long story short, I ended up going there and the meeting started with a prayer, which I thought was great and thought it was appropriate. And then as soon as the prayer ended, I was basically told that I was being fired and uh, I was fired for uh, having, quote, an association with uh, those kind of people. <laughs> so I never was really told specifically what the issue was. They didn't actually even say flat earth, but they said, uh, we've, we've been to the website, we've been to the conference site, and uh, we can't have a minister with that kind of association. And so they told me, uh, we can't have you in our pulpit Sunday. And that just blew me away. And so they never asked me what I actually believe. They never asked what sessions you know we went to, why we were there. Uh, it was a total uh, knee-jerk, fear, power and control reaction that was really born out of gossip. It was a gossip situation. And uh, since the day I got fired, uh, many of the speakers uh, in this community and others reached out to me, and, and uh, it just started me down a path of realizing that God had answered my prayer, not in the way that I had expected it, but uh, he was moving in some powerful ways. And uh, the last three months, we've just been doing so much related to uh, biblical creation, uh, attending several conferences this fall. So that's that's kind of it in a nutshell. All right. Well, I know that for all of us, that when approached with this particular topic and asked by our listeners and readers, different individuals to look into it, that many were hesitant. I was extremely hesitant to do so. And for those that are in the listening audience or in the chat room that think this topic is just completely insane and ludicrous, believe me, we were all there with you and believe the same thing until entering open-minded into it. We did the research and discovered that there's no measurable curvature. And so, you know, no matter what you think about the shape of the earth, there is no curvature, and so that forces a paradigm shift. But, um, Robbie, I'd like for you, if you wouldn't mind, can you share a little bit about your experience in dealing with the church as well and how you were banned um, for even doing the work that you do? Sure. Well, the, the first church that we were attending, uh, we'd been there for quite some time. It was pretty much our home church family were getting very established. We were very close with the pastor and his wife and many people in that church. And uh, right from the very get-go, as I got into this investigation, I was talking with the pastor. And, you know, we got into the moon landing and even got to a point where even his children were starting to question things. And they were talking with their children about maybe they didn't land on the moon. It was, you know, because this pastor, you know, was definitely open-minded and he didn't buy everything that, uh, you know, was told. Interesting, but, but uh, um, you know, about six, seven months into the journey, I was told one night over the phone that at some point there was going to be an ultimatum that I was going to be presented with. The, the board would present me, the elders would, would present me with an ultimatum. It was either, you know, give up my channel or give up the church. And, you know, that really upset me. For me, it was a big learning lesson. It was a very painful learning lesson. But again, I wasn't, wasn't angry at that point. It was like, well, you know, this just won't work out. You know, uh, the church dynamics of the way they looked at their governance, um, you know, was a little bit strict in my opinion. So, you know, we just had a parting of ways. Well, the second church, um, you, you know, I laid everything out on the table um, and right from the get go, the first meeting we met for coffee and I just spilled it out. Here's my channel. Here's my documentary. You know, watch everything. You know, let me know, because I'd gone to a second church that had a very open policy when it came to secondary doctrines. While they had differences, they knew that the essentials were the most important and they had something, a clause in their bylaws called religious liberty. 
which meant in your free time, you were allowed to kind of freely choose to talk about whatever you wanted as long as it was secondary. So this was great. This was a great church. Uh, there was good teachings. Um, you know, we were happy with it. And again, about eight months into this journey, um, it happened actually where, you know, they had watched uh, scientism exposed. Uh, there was a little bit of concern in there and stuff, but they were willing to work with me and, you know, and we had a really good discussion. But uh, what happened was what was really surprising. And I knew what was happening here was that my uh, wife was approached by a lady saying, you know, would you help in the nursery? We need some help. And my wife's really amazing with babies. And she was obviously there because, you know, our daughter at the time was uh, very, very young and she was in the nursery helping out. So she came to me and she asked, you know, would it be okay to help in the nursery? And I thought, well, this is a wonderful way to, you know, get, inter you know, get basically involved in the church and help out you know and i thought it was a wonderful idea so she went back to the lady and said yeah i would love to well the next week uh we went to church the lady came up to my wife and said i'm really really sorry i apologize but leadership told me you're not going to be able you're not going to be able to help out in nursery <laughs> so when my wife came to me crying and all upset i said to her i said you need to write a letter i knew exactly what was coming at this point because i knew that where they were going uh, this one was a little bit different. This wasn't a learning lesson. This was, you know, based on principle. And I shared my story at the first Flat Earth International Conference in Canada that I put on in Edmonton, Alberta, my home city. And I shared the journey. And I even mentioned these two churches by name and their names. And I know that some of the media actually even contacted, contacted them. And they said no comment. But it really came down to this, that when I sat down and I was pleading with them to show me from the Bible where I'm in error, like show me where I'm in error, help, help a brother, they, they couldn't. And then this is what this whole discussion revolves around. It comes down to we're at a point now in history where the church is dealing, you know, with situations like this, where they're not even bringing the Bible into it. They're actually bringing NASA and science so to me, this is a very, very critical point that we're at, and it's a very important topic because it's not just, you know, me and my family. We've had families over at our house that have all been kicked out of the churches. I've heard people that have been fired. Again, you know, Pastor Nate Wolf is an example, but there's been many pastors that have reached out anonymously to me, not wanting to be revealed. That's why I was so excited when Pastor Nate was willing to come forward and put his name out there because this was happening a lot. And I think with courage that people are standing out. And again, we have to do this in love. We have to do this also, you know, making sure that we're standing on the truth, but it's based on the principle that if we're not standing on God's word, again, what are we standing on? We're going to fall for anything if we don't stand on the word of God. So to me, this is an important, critical point. Um, I'm very passionate about it, and I'm just going to continue to speak out uh, on this and hopefully wake up as many people as, you know, I can, you know, in the uh, ministry that God set f before me. But honestly, if it comes down to standing on the word of God versus listening to what scientism has taught us our whole life, I'm going to stand on the word of God every time. Me too. And I know that everybody here is with you on that as well. Uh, Rob, would you mind sharing a little bit about your story? Because um, many people know you as a researcher that has come forth with your books and bringing forth information on the fallen angels, the giants, the New World Order, Mystery Babylon, all of these different concepts. And you've been a, a, a prominent speaker on the alternative truth circuit for quite a long time. Um, but in coming forth with this particular topic and this particular um, knowledge, you have also been ostracized and blacklisted like myself. Um, to a lot of different you know, platforms, uh, to say the least. But if you would, can you speak a little bit about, you know, kind of what you have had to deal with as well in, in standing on this truth as well? <laughs> Where to begin, right? <laughs> right, yeah, right. Um, well, yeah, as you said, uh, I got started talking about sort of end times, you know, in the field of eschatology, you know, talking about end time events. And it started with my Babylon Rising research, which dealt primarily with Nimrod and uh, in ancient times, and as well as what's going on in current uh, Iraq, Babylon area, and how that all relates to us. And uh, you know, at first I made a, a pretty good splash with that, and 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 my first talk was mythology and the coming great deception, followed by the Mount Hermon Roswell connection, both of which were very well received, and. Uh, launched me onto the speaking circuit. I mean, that's what uh, got us started in uh, doing public speaking and stuff. And I was traveling. I had done a lot of other public speaking, but it was more like uh, self-help type stuff. 
Um, but this put me on the speaking circuit with other um, popular people out there that uh, deal with end times and stuff like that. And that was all well and good, especially when I was talking about the, the Nimrod stuff and the Nephilim stuff. Everybody really liked that stuff. But the last chapter of that first book, Babylon Rising, and the first shall be last, dealt with um, truth or tradition. And it dealt with, yeah, I guess what? Our holidays, we call holidays, uh, have nothing to do with Jesus. And, you know, I didn't even want to write that chapter, but the, the previous chapter was called Coming Out of Babylon, which dealt primarily with geopolitical issues and our troops in Iraq and all that kind of stuff. But I got a tap on my shoulder, I felt like, and the Holy Spirit was saying, you know what? you got to come out of Babylon, too. And I'm like, I'm not in Babylon. Yeah, you are. <laughs> and so— you know, that that is where I sort of came out regarding my take on the Sabbath and how there are still com- Ten Commandments. There's not just nine. Uh, the feasts are still important, and dealing with the pagan connections of the so-called holidays that most of us celebrate was not a popular stance to take. Um, <laughs> and that got me into a fair amount of trouble. It still is getting me in a fair amount of trouble, actually, uh, especially this time of the year. Um, right. And—, and Along the same time I was going through all that, as I started getting more into the Torah, looking at Isaiah 46.10, because Isaiah 46.10 says that God has declared the end from the beginning. So here I am doing all these conferences on end times while ignoring the beginning, uh, except for the cool stuff, right? I'm, I'm finding all the, the giants and the Nimrod stuff and the Tower of Babel, all these interesting, cool Sunday school story stuff. But you know what? Uh, Yeshua is all over the uh, Torah also. And uh, w- M- Sheila had this idea. She said, why don't, we, why don't we try reading both ends of the Bible toward the middle? Like read Genesis and Revelation, Exodus and Jude, and kind of work our way toward the middle. And I thought, well, I've done a lot of one-year Bible plans before. I've never done that. That's, that's an interesting idea. Um, we never completed it, but I got what I think the, the intent of that uh, exercise was, was to show me something. And having just read Genesis and just read Revelation, when I got to Exodus, I very quickly realized, wait a second here, all of the plagues and judgment that we read about in Revelation are a direct correlation, uh, amped up repeat of the plagues of Exodus. And so I drew up a, a chart and I had the plagues of Exodus on the left and the plagues of Revelation on the right, and they're perfectly matched. And I'm going, wow, look at this. I mean, truly, if you want to understand the end, you've got to go back to the beginning. And so there's no rapture. There's no pre-trib rapture. You know, people are going through stuff, you know, um, and all the excuses I was hearing, well, and I used to use it myself about, uh, well, Noah, he's an example of rapture. Well, that, he went through the thing. He, he didn't get zapped up into the sky, you know, a uh, lot. Right. He went through the thing. You know, he, he, he was rescued to an earthbound place of safety during the judgment. He wasn't flying up into the sky. Israelites, during the plagues of Exodus, they went. Th- they experienced three of the ten plagues, but for the other seven, they were preserved in an earthbound place of safety called Goshen, but they went through it, you know, and, and then the deliverance came after it. You know, so every example that I was seeing, especially spending time in the beginning to understand the end, I could find no precedence for any idea of a preacher of rapture. So, when I started publicly speaking out against the preacher of rapture, that was like, ooh, that, that I thought it was bad before. It got real bad, you know, at that point. Um, you know, people always <laughs> like to say that I'm doing what I do for the money. I'm like, well, if, if that's the case, I'm always picking the wrong topics. Because right. all the, all the money is, you know, you wanna, if, you want, if you want money, talk about preacher of rapture. That's where the big bucks are at, right? Everybody wants to hear about how they're getting out of everything. Uh, so, you know, that's sort of the beginning of me getting blacklisted. And then, of course— the topic of the Nephilim, I, I was one of the few, if not only guys, especially in the beginning, talking about a different view other than multiple incursions of angels coming back and mating with women again and again, which is the dominant view uh, of the Nephilim Genesis 6 issue. So, uh, you know, that wasn't causing me a whole lot of trouble. It was co- it was cause for some interesting debate, uh, but it was always in good fun. I mean, the other scholars out there like to take pot shots at me, but I could stand my own. And so we would, you know, get into these sometimes public uh, back and forth, but it was all good. You know, it wasn't like Mm -hmm. hate and you're a heretic and all that kind of stuff. So there was that. And then in 2014, I was led to elaborate on something that I started in 2009 that I called the Yahuwah Triangle. And the three points in the triangle are Egypt, 
Israel, and Iraq, specifically the Giza Plateau, Shechem, and Babylon, uh, and or Jerusalem. You know, Shechem or Jerusalem, you can take your pick. So I, you know, you put you put a, a pin in each of those locations, and well, you got a triangle right there. And my thesis was that a whole lot of the Bible ping pongs between these three right here. And so I did a, a 10 hour teaching in, in December, 2014 called the Hua triangle that I honestly thought this was my magnum opus. This was like everything in my life was poured into this, you know, and I thought this was it. Four months later, I make the mistake of listening to Mark Sargent on a <laughs> Canary, Canary cry radio <laughs> interview and decided to explore that. And wow. I mean, Whatever few circles I was still welcome in, they kicked me out you know, at that point. Right, right. And, you know, everything hit the fan. And it was, uh, you know, it was a rough deal, really, from 2015 through mid-2016 and really into the beginning of 2017. But in the recent 2017 and 18, uh, I've seen a shift. And more importantly, what, you know, this week's Torah portion is the, the, the reconciliation of Joseph with his brothers. And, you know, he got a bum deal, you know, but he said, you know what, what, what you guys, what men meant for evil, God meant for good. Mm -hmm. And I can look back and say that right now where I can see, look at the abuses of the past and the hardships of the past and the difficulty of it all. But my desire through all of it was only to take a stand on what the Bible says. This, I claim this is my book. This is my source for truth. So I took a stand on it. And while men began to hate me more and more, and sadly, it was mostly Christians and even worse, Torah people, <laughs> um, the favor of God was poured out on us, my wife and I, like I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And fruit, good fruit. I mean, this is what keeps me in the game is when you see testimony after testimony after testimony, hundreds by now, maybe even thousands of atheists, former atheists, now cracking open the Bible for the first time, many of them realizing the necessity of obeying him and walking in a relationship with Yeshua as they get into the New Testament. That's what makes it all worth it. So, okay, fine. I don't have the acceptance of men. I don't care. I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for God. So, you know, anybody that's out there who's thinking they're going to take a stand for truth, well, you know, all of us on this call right now, I think every one of us can easily testify it will cost you. Yes. But, but the rewards are worth it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very well said. And uh, I want to ask you, we're going to go to Robbie and then we'll go to Nate. I want to ask both of you guys uh, why you think it's so difficult for people to take this issue seriously. And then also, um, how far of a shift have you seen just in the past couple of years? Robbie? Oh, wow. That's just a multifaceted question. I mean, there's so yeah. many answers to it, but uh, wow. I mean, I don't know where I can start on that. Again, like Rob brought up before, while he's diving into things, for example, like pre-trib rapture, when you come against certain doctrines that have been in place for a very long time, you're going to have a lot of persecution. You're going to have a lot of attack. And yeah, right. everyone on this call, when you stand for truth, I mean, you are going to come under fire. Absolutely. I mean, there's things that are in place that have just been the norm for a very long time. Now, when we get into certain paradigms, like the entire worldview that shaped, you know, from a very early <laughs> age, uh, and again, in, in direct violation to the word of God, we're talking about indoctrination to the, the, I mean, the furthest level that I can think of, because, you know, even from grade one, you're not really indoctrinated with too much stuff, but there's that globe, there's that solar system, right? Yes. I mean, they have solar systems above cribs. Babies are actually looking up at the actual solar system with planets going around. I mean, this is, you know, a very, I mean, you see wallpaper, you know, from a very early age. And like I always say, you know, they introduced the whole dinosaur thing and they introduced the space thing. And I've always said this, that the dinosaurs secure the entire narrative. Dinosaurs are really cool. They're fascinating. But what it does is it secures the evolution narrative, right? Yes. That there were millions and millions of years ago, dinosaurs existed, right? So that, that basically secures the past of this story. And then space, the final frontier, where we're heading and where we're going to go is the future. So again, this is the two paradigms that they put together from a very early age. So for me, I mean, this is why I think this topic, uh, you know, like Rob was explaining in this journey, as you, you know, uncover things, whether it's a, you know, feast or if it's on certain days or holidays, anytime you come against kind of the mainstream, you know, narrative that's been put in place for a very long time, you're going to come under fire. So I think that we're getting into more of the upper echelon 
of things that have been hidden for a very long time. Satan has been able to kind of hold them, or it just wasn't the right time where God wanted to start revealing them uh, to people. I feel that, you know, when you know Romans is very clear that says the creation truly testifies to the true creator. So if I'm the adversarial, if I'm Satan, my number one way is going to destroy the credibility of the Bible without like even raising a finger, like even, right. you know, going to war is you just have to basically assault the credibility of Genesis, the creation narrative. And, you know, what I found fascinating about this is think about it this way. You know, Rob will bring this up a lot of times and it's totally true. But look, most Christians, you know, plenty of them will already agree that there's a massive conspiracy and cover ups going on with evolution to secure that, you know, and they know mm -hmm. the dangers of evolution. So really, I mean, why wouldn't they lie about other things? And again, it's not about men lying. It's about Satan being behind, being the puppet master. He will have this entire thing, you know, secured, especially when it goes in direct opposition to the word of God. So what we're finding is when we take a literal stance on the word of God, and I think everyone on this call can agree that if we're going to be laughed at, mocked, ridiculed, persecuted, you know, what better way to be ones and be known for standing on the word of God, taking it literal, especially when it comes to creation, because, you know, it's very, very clear. And, you know, all generations could understand up and down. All generations could understand, you know, everything that's basically put in the Bible, especially from, you know, Genesis through when it comes to very simplistic things like creation, not understanding how all the mechanisms work fully. But we can basically take him at his word saying that, wait a minute, there's not one verse to support that this earth is moving, doing anything. And I will say this, that even poetically, even in Psalms, if there was a verse that said, the earth flies through the heavens like an eagle, I wouldn't even be on this call tonight. That would be, yeah, right. be over for me. Because even poetry conveys something. It would convey movement. There's not one verse to support a heliocentric narrative. And again, that's just the start of it. We can get into geocentric you know, versus heliocentric. But again, this rabbit hole goes a lot deeper. It's not just about geocentrism versus heliocentrism. It's really Satan has assaulted every ounce of every single thing the Word of God has to say about creation, about the earth, the sun, moon, and stars. And that's exactly what we're here for. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll go into the reasons why uh, soon. But Pastor Nate, um, I wanted to just ask you, since you've been a pastor of a church for 20 years, um, has this topic come up before? I mean, is because um, it's been there the whole time. We just have never considered it. But yet, all of a sudden, 2015, it seems like the Most High made this an issue and wants us to consider it for whatever reason. And I think that has to do uh, with the coming of the Antichrist, which we'll speak on uh, in, a, in a little bit. But uh, was this ever a topic? Did you ever think about it or consider it? Or um, is this still new to you and to the congregation? Um, uh, what's your feelings and what's your insight on all that? Well, for me, uh, I had never heard, really heard of this before. I probably heard, you know, Flat Earth mentioned a few times, you know, maybe uh, from Obama or somebody like that. But I, I don't, I mean, I, I, you know, study Genesis and I, you know, taught and preached on Genesis, you know, I'm sure many times before. I think, uh, you know, as Robbie was answering, the, the indoctrination is just so powerful. And when you look at scriptures like Revelation 12, 9, and that talk about the deception of Satan, mm -hmm. um, I think people are so deceived. And so for me, I, in, until God really just threw it in my face and, and revealed some things to me that I realized, you know, there's some foundation to this. And number one, the, the I mean, I was interested in, you know, empirical evidence and, and, you know, that sort of thing, observation, the senses. But what really tipped the scales uh, for me was the scriptures that were being presented. And so I'd never heard of this in, you know, 20 something years of ministry, the different, a uh, couple of different churches that I'd worked for. Uh, there had always been, you know, fringe topics. And I had always uh, been willing to study fringe, you know, truth topics. And I had done different studies on various subjects over the years. So I think, I think that uh, the father knew that I was uh, in that mode that I was willing, you know, I cared about truth. I was willing to, at least on my own, you know, uh, study some things that others uh, might not be willing to do. But when this, when this uh, topic came up for me, 
um, you know, I knew that it was way out of the mainstream. And so for a good chunk of it, it was more my private, you know, thoughts, study, and then, of course, talking with my wife. Uh, and there was really only one person in the church that that I knew uh, that actually kind of approached me and uh, asked me some questions and come to find out that she also was researching a lot of different issues and Flat Earth was one of them. So I think, you know, most people, they, they, especially in the, in the modern culture, it is so heavily ridiculed. And, you know, as, as all of you guys can see the, the mainstream, the media, the comedians, all of these people, especially in the last year plus, uh, have really, really gone hardcore And the, and the news, the major news outlets, the last several months have, you know, really been putting out, uh, mostly hit pieces. There's been some decent, you know, fair reporting, but that's the exception to the rule. And so I think a lot of people, even if they uh, have this subject broached, they're counting the cost and they're going, man, uh, they already know that it's ridiculed all, you know, in the mainstream. And so they're thinking, man, I don't want to lose my friends if this is true. So I think we go into this kind of self-preservation mode the indoctrination kicks in and a lot of people just blow it off. You know, they'll make a statement like, well, you know, this doesn't have anything to do with my salvation or blah, blah, blah. You know, they'll just make all kinds of excuses as to why they don't need to go there. But, uh, and I can only, you know, speak as a minister. I think many other ministers, they're doing the math too. And they know that there's a good chance that they could get fired, uh, over something like this. And, uh, and most of the ministers, unfortunately, are they're thinking about how can I provide for my family? So mm-hmm. they don't want to get fired from a church. And then, you know, where's their source of income? Well, their their needs are being met by the congregation. So if they apply for another congregation after having been fired for some, you know, crazy topic like Flat Earth, uh, they're very concerned about that. Now, I know, you know, God's timing is perfect, obviously. In my situation, I had been struggling for years with Church Inc., you know, and I had been Mm -hmm. struggling. I'd been struggling trying to work with elders who generally were good men, but they they were running the church like a corporation, you know, the whole American model. And so that had really been running me down. And I'd had some, some scrapes and scraps with leaders before, and so when I got fired, I, I knew immediately, I am not looking for another job with the church. I'm done. You know, I'm done mm-hmm. with that. That that system was chewing me up, you know. Yes. And yeah. so it, I was just determined that this is biblical truth. And all my life, you know, I've claimed to believe and, and to teach biblical truth. And so it just became very crystal clear to me what, what I needed to do. Now, I didn't know if, at first how that was going to you know, work out. But, uh, I think most ministers would have just not brought it up. Um, if, if they did get fired, they certainly would have, would not have gone public like I did because that would scrap their chances of getting hired again with the church. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. So basically pastors and preachers, ministers are in the same kind of situation as educators, professors, and other PhD academians who have their livelihoods, their careers, their pensions, uh, yeah. you know, all of that dependent upon kind of towing the line and uh, making the status quo. Yeah. And I was of the opinion and understanding that if this was what God was doing and I felt that he was answering my prayer just immediately, you know, it wasn't, again, it wasn't the way I had expected, uh, I was hoping the elders would listen and we'd study the Bible together and maybe, you know, there was a chance, but, uh, you know, (laughs) but, you know, it was made real clear, real quick that Nate, what I'm doing is I'm going to completely remove you out of this system so far removed that, that you're completely free. And so basically God was telling me buckle up, you know, and, uh, if it wasn't for, you know, these guys in, in, on the radio show and some others, uh, you know, I don't know that I would have been able to navigate that as, as well as I did. So I'm really thankful, thankful for you guys in, in helping with that. But yeah, so I didn't have any fear. Uh, I knew that God would provide financially for my family 
if I stayed true to his word and yes, uh, tr trusted good. him, trusted him in prayer, you know, followed his will. Uh, and he, and he is doing that, you know, he is beginning to do that. And, and so we're very thankful. Awesome. I wanted to mention yeah, real quick too, because we're talking, yeah, please. I want to, I want to just mention really quickly that we're talking a lot about, you know, negativity and things that are happening on this journey. But I did want to mention that when I did put on the conference in Canada, um, I guess three times a charm, but the third church now that we're going to, again, he doesn't believe in flat earth and there's a long story there, but he's very open and very supportive of what I'm doing. He's come to my premieres for my documentaries. He came out to the conference in Canada to check everything out. And also he just uh, two days ago came out to his first flat earth meetup. I invited him awesome. out and he wanted to come out. So what I'm saying is, you know, while I've, while we've been going to this church, and he's been kind of, you know, digesting this information, taking it in slowly. He's already come full, you know, geocentric. He does say that. He'll go on the record mm -hmm. and say, I'm 100% geocentric. He goes, I'm not sure where I am with the whole flat earth thing yet. But, you know, I'm learning. I'm taking it all in. And that's the thing. Sometimes we're in such a rush for people just to, you know, instantly believe, you know, like us. Mm -hmm. True. I think sometimes we got to just give people that, that time. Um, because, again, these topics are way out there for, for the majority of people. And they need time to just examine it. And we just need to give people some time. But I just wanted to bring that up because, like you were mentioning before, uh, Pastor Nate, that, you know, there's other pastors out there. Well, I mean, he's case in point. I mean, they've been yeah. incredible to our family, supportive. And, you know, he's still, you know, engaging in conversation and wanting to really learn. So, again, I think that uh, so far with what I'm seeing with the church we're at now, um, it's been a wonderful thing. So I think some people are definitely called to leave the quote unquote church. And then there's other people that for me, for whatever reason, God's called me not to leave the church to sure. actually be involved in the church right and affect change there and stuff. And I know yes. that we all have our different, our, our different missions and our different uh, directions. And that's the beautiful thing is that we have to understand that everyone's on a different path. And maybe for someone, maybe the whole creation thing's just not their thing. Maybe they're into, you know, satanic ritual abuse and that's their focus. So I learned a lot actually at Take on the World because I saw a lot of people coming together where they all had different focuses. And just because we disagreed, it didn't mean that it wasn't, you know, effective and they were less of a brother. And I think that's mm -hmm. the important thing that we really have to stress, you know, uh, working together because this whole idea, like uh, Pastor Nate was mentioning, you know, being, you know, kicked out of his church for associations. Well, the same type of stuff is happening in certain circles right now where it's like, well, you're being associated with this person. I don't agree with this <laughs> doctrine. And I think we got to take a step back and say, wait a minute. Other than the essentials, let's be very careful before we start slamming different doctrines, because most of us on our journey, we probably believe one of these doctrines that now we're speaking out against. Right. Mm -hmm, so the right. question is, what are we going to speak out right now that we're defending in 20 years? So we're always kind of, you know, um, down this path. And I just think it's very, very important to, you know, and I'm a big believer in that. Sometimes it gets hard and discouraging, but I really think and I'm going to continue, um, you know, planting seeds and kind of being that positive um, example and saying, look, there's ways to approach certain things. And sometimes we got to remember, Hey, we are like, we're like, you know, we're, if you think about it, we're like outcast. I mean, we've been outcast yes. from the majority of mainstream church and there's a reason for that, you know? And sometimes we have to just understand that, that if we're on the same page with these things and we're working together and our hearts are in the same place that we need to look at the gospel as the most important people coming to the saving knowledge of the Messiah and Jesus as the only way Again, let's not get distracted because I think Satan is really going to play that game. And because, again, you know, divided we fall. But especially with the unity when it comes to the body of Christ, man, this is nothing new, man. Christians have fought from day one. doesn't matter whether you're Torah or Christian or whatever you want to say. The fact is Satan will play with every group and try to, you know, destroy any type of building up of any momentum. And I think that the people here on this panel understand that. And I think it's important that we uh, move forward on that. And we try to, you know, just stay positive while we are going to run into a lot of discouragement and there's going to be a lot of persecution. Again, you know, greater is he that is in us than he who is in the world. And we have nothing to fear, you know, but fear itself. So I think uh, we have to fear God, you know, walk in his commandments, obey him. And that's the prerequisite to truly loving God. And that's what it's all about. If we love God, we're going to do what, he, what he's called us to do. We're going to obey him. And we're going to move forward regardless of the opposition, persecution, because great is the reward that's going to be, you know, in heaven. Amen. Well said. And I appreciate uh, your example of being like that, brother, because I agree that especially when it's not a salvational issue that we come together, we have all of us are not going to agree 100 percent on everything. And if we have differences of opinions, let's be able to you know, man up, talk about it and be reasonable, respectful and honorable uh, in sharing discussion. I don't think that, you know, we have to condemn and judge and criticize and 
um, uh, and that we should try to, you know, affiliate where we can and, and have uh, adult discussion on topics. But there definitely the whole divide and conquer uh, controlled opposition thing that seems to be a, a a large facet of what we're dealing with. Uh, but Rob, I wanted to ask you also um, what your opinion is on the cognitive dissonance, because I, it's the most difficult thing for people just to overcome their indoctrination to even consider new possibility. And for most people, they won't ever even get over that hurdle. And so just um, your comment and opinion on that. Yeah, just uh, real quick before I do, I just saw that Nathan Thompson posted uh, two minutes ago. He says, wow, I'm supposed to be live right now with Zen, Robbie, Skiba, Pastor Nate, but they shut down my Skype account and I can't get it back up again. Yeah, he uh, messaged me. I, um, okay. Yeah, yeah, apparently he's he's dealing with some censorship or something. Um, yeah, as far as the, as far as the um, cognitive dissonance issue goes, you know, we, we are doomed from birth in this system right now because we come practically out of the womb into indoctrination. You know, um, if you're a Christian, you got the one guy in front and you're not really, you know, he's telling you what the way it is and you don't really, it's not like you can raise your hand in church and say, uh, you know, pastor, I don't really think that's what that verse is talking about. <laughs> you know, you, you will, you will be getting the left, <laughs> the left boot of fellowship. For <laughs> sure. So, so you have no, there's no open forum for discussion in religion for the most part. Right, right. Uh, you go to school and it's the same, same model. You got the one person in the front and you got to stay in lockstep or you don't graduate. You got to answer the questions the way they, you know, want you to answer. You know, I, as, as much as I differ with Kent Hovind on the issue of cosmology, I still love the guy for empowering an entire generation of people, if not several generations of people to be able to still take a stand in the public school with truth, you know? Um, and I remember, I don't remember if I, he told me this or if I just got this from his teaching or what, what the deal was, but after he came through town and, you know, our church was very supportive of his ministry. Um, and I got all of his, I think it was like six or 10 VHS tapes or something back in the day. Uh, the whole collection of his creation uh, stuff, you know, but to, to, to be in a public school, they, they give you a test and you have to answer the way the textbook says, you know, you're supposed to, or you don't graduate. Right. So I would get the test and in science class and, you know, how old is the earth? Well, according to the textbook, 4.6 billion years, despite the fact that blah, 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 blah. And I would give, <laughs> you know, so my, it took me longer to finish my test, but you know, I, I guess, you know, for me personally, I have been wired and I, I would say this is, a credit to my parents and the way they think also to question everything. In fact, uh, a number of years ago, I found my baby book at my mom's house and I, I'm the firstborn. So she kept fairly extensive notes on my early development and under the, the, where it talked about speech, she wrote, he constantly questions everything. <laughs> and, and then later it was, you know, most peculiar thing baby said. And she said, she wrote, he wrote, she wrote that I had said, I just don't believe it. <laughs> so like I have been wired that way, but I don't think most people in society are wired to question. They just get into these systems of indoctrination, whether it is school or religion or what have you, where they don't have a voice. They just have to do what they're told. And when I married Sheila, uh, her son was 13 at the time and I adopted him and you know, he would bring home a study guide for his test. And I'm thinking, okay, study guide, cool, you know, and it's going to help him out, right? So we look at it, and it's not a study guide. It's the answers to the test. And I'm like, did you did you steal this? Did you get? Did you take this from your team? No, this is what we all got. Everybody in the class gets a study guide. It's not a study guide. It was the actual answers to the test. So I start inquiring and find out, yeah, that's the policy. I'm like, holy cow, no one is – being taught how to think they're right. being taught how to regurgitate information so when we come out with things that are contrary to the indoctrination yeah i mean that's the knee-jerk response and we're going to get massive amounts of cognitive dissonance and um 
when my family uh, it was last year, I think, or the year before, uh, I think it was last year. Yeah, because it was my 10th anniversary. So um, my uh, Sheila and I had our 10th anniversary. My sister was 20th and my parents 50th. So we did a big family hoo-ha and we all went out to uh, Hawaii as a family and celebrated our respective anniversaries, right? So we go on this uh, boat tour and uh, uh, we went snorkeling. And it was a lot of beautiful you know, fish and uh, corals and all kinds of stuff to, to look at and stuff. So we're on the way back. The uh, tour guide on the boat is showing flashcards of the different forms of life that we saw, you know, and is explaining all of this in terms of evolution, you know, and this, you know, evolved so many million years ago, blah, 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 blah. And it's all evolution, right? So as we're getting off the boat, the woman that was in front of me complimented the girl and said, wow, that was really great. You did such a good job with uh, explaining all that. And she goes, well, I was just glad to finally be able to put my degree to good use. And I thought, you know, that's that's the problem, you know. And this kid, this kid is innocent, but thoroughly indoctrinated. She goes to a system, it goes to a school system, where you have a person at the front of the room that you respect and that you're taught to believe is an authority that you should trust, and so you don't question anything. Well, the, the authority that I trust said this, so it must be true. And that's what got us all into trouble, both in religion as well as the sciences and everything else. Nobody has questioned anything. They just parrot what they were told to believe. And so the knee-jerk reaction when somebody comes along and says, well, you know, that's probably not true. That's why people go psycho on you, because you're, you're messing with their programming. You know, and I'm, I'm really against that whole system. You know, people mock us at the conferences and stuff. And one of the things that kept coming up at the Canada conference that the press was saying is not a PhD among them, you know, no real credible science, you know, scientists in the group as if that's a prerequisite for intelligence, you know, that you have to have an indoctrination degree to, to, to be smart. Well, no, it's funny you say that Rob, Rob, it's funny you say that because now in all the interviews, I always bring that up that everyone's sitting there critical saying, well, what scientists are here? I'm like, well, how come every time on mainstream media, you guys bring on an actor, not yeah. even a scientist, and he talks all things science. So I go, how hypocritical are you? And it really gets yeah. them thinking. They just stop and they pause and they're like, oh, so use Bill Nye as an example, because he's one of the main speaking pieces they use and he's not a scientist. So say, what's up with that? Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I'm actually taking on a new policy that I already had a policy of if you're going to interview me, I get to videotape you interviewing me. I've added to that policy. I get to ask you questions first, and then uh, you can interview me, and I will record you interviewing me. That's my prerequisite for being interviewed because I'm going to start asking them. I'm going to say two plus two is, and they'll say four. I'll say the sky is, and they'll say blue. And then I'll say we evolved from, and they're going to say monkeys. And that's where I'm going to have them. Yeah, and I'm going to go from there. I'll let them tie their own noose and then in no uncertain terms, let them know that they do not have the intellectual high ground in this discussion. OK, now that we've established that, what would you like to talk to me about? <laughs> A great point. Great point. Uh, Nathan, are you with us, too, brother? Nathan's in the house. All awesome. right, man. Well, thanks for, uh, you know, being able to join us and uh, just to catch you up to, you know, speed on what we've been discussing is we were just talking about the um, the cognitive dissonance and why it's so difficult for people to overcome their indoctrination uh, to even open themselves to this new possibility. But before going forward, can you tell people who you are and about your group? Um, Nathan runs the largest uh, flat earth uh, group on Facebook and, and just, you know, your internet, your YouTube, stuff like that. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on. Um, as far Thanks as all the other people that are, you guys are all legends, um, so I'm very honored to be on with all you guys. Uh, so I run the official flat earth and globe discussion on Facebook, 130,000 members, no cursing, no insults. My Instagram is the globe is flat. My YouTube channel is Nathan Thompson. Uh, I started out doing mostly just experiments and trying to figure out where I live. Then I kind of moved towards activism and just sharing the truth. And I'll, I'll say one thing about the cognitive dissonance. Uh, I think it's spiritual more than anything because like even people who blindly believe everything about their Bible don't accept the flat earth cosmology, 
even though it's like right in your face with all the science, but uh, I think it's a spiritual blocking. So that's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, God like uh, re reveals this flat earth truth to who he wants to reveal it to. Um, so I don't get too caught up on like the people who get it or don't get it. I just um, share it with them and uh, spend time with the people who deserve it, you know? It's a great point. It's a totally great point because I believe too as well that uh, there's a reason why, you know, we've been woken up and we shouldn't take a spiritual high ground saying that we're better than anyone else because, you know, we can figure out Genesis and no one else can. Again, I think there's a real humbling in this and we got to remember that this, you know, comes great responsibility, you know, like they always say. So that's a great, great point. I just wanted to mention that. Thanks for sharing that, Nathan. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, you know, it was a long time coming for all of us. And so we know how difficult it is to finally decide to, you know, myself, I always asked everybody to remain open-minded to everything that I talk about and because I do cover a lot of very controversial topics. And so for myself, it was either prove myself a hypocrite or do the research. And then doing the research, it was not, but even the first day, you know, I'm coming across Samuel Burley Robotham, the Bedford level experiments, and then seeing uh, videos by individuals like ODD talking about the non-existing curvature. It does not take much true research at all to confirm that there is no measurable curvature. And then the other thing, as you had mentioned, Robbie, is that there's no movement. We are not moving at 1,037 miles an hour. And if we were, really, I don't think life on the surface of the Earth would be possible because uh, the wind shear would be a truly annihilating, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but we've got like four minutes remaining, so I want to... Does anybody have a comment before we move into the break? And when we come back from the break, we'll talk about the reasons you know, for this deception, the reasons why we believe this is all coming out now. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say real quick, too, because Robbie brought up a great point. Um, you know, even though I was done uh, being in submission to church leaders that were basically, you know, controlling and unfair, uh, there's a lot of people in the church, even in the church that fired me, that really had nothing to do with my firing. You know, it was it was five men that met basically secretly and entertained some gossip and, and made the decision, you know, under their authority. Uh, the neat thing is, is that I've had conversations, I've had some studies with folks from the congregation and uh, still have some open lines of communication with folks. So I recognize fully that just because I'm not there and just because I got fired doesn't mean that God is not also working on some of the hearts and minds there. So I'm very, very excited because I know there's going to be some fruit that comes out from the congregation itself, not just from what I'm doing now, but uh, there will be some fruit. There's going to be some uh, changes, but uh, the people that are there saw how me and my family were treated. And so it's going to take, you know, people that are really fervent in prayer uh, and are able to overcome that fear uh, because, you know, they realize that if they stick their necks up for truth, they could also face ridicule. So I would ask for, for folks to be praying for the folks at the, at the congregation. And, uh, you know, I think we'll see some fruit here in the near future. So I'm kind of excited because God's been doing amazing things and you never know when you're going to get a phone call or a knock at your door. Um, and so I've tried to keep, you know, those lines uh, open with, with every person who has reached out to us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, well, I just want to remind the listening audience that um, Revolution Radio is the largest commercial-free, corporate-free, uh, listener-sponsored radio network on the uh, plane of the earth, and that if you would, those of you that can't afford to, please do go to freedomslips.com, click on the donate button, and for the price of even a Happy Meal for those of you that eat McDonald's, uh, you can gain access to the archives of all the hosts uh, here on both Studios A and Studio B. All right, we'll be right back, everyone. See you soon.
Christian Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. All right, welcome back, everybody, for second hour. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is the dark side of purgatory, usually with the hijacker. And I have many uh, guest speakers, and we're doing a roundtable discussion on cosmology than the matrix of illusion. Uh, but I do want to remind listeners that I am um, offering, for those of you that can donate, Twenty-five dollars to the um, to the network at freedomslips.com. Just click on the donate button there, and if you send a message in, I will send you an autographed copy of one of my books. Um, and so, just send that message to Nighthawk as you give a twenty-five dollar donation, and he'll send me your address, and I will send you an autographed copy, <clears throat> or to even somebody. Um, uh, personalize it to somebody, family, loved one, friend, whoever. Uh, so again, just go to freedomslips.com, click $25 or more a donation, and I'll be glad to get that book out to you within a week. Uh, before moving on, uh, Nathan wanted to share a story. Um, and so Nathan, if you would. Yes, and um, so last week we had a meeting with my girlfriend Ashlyn's pastor. He uh, wanted to talk to her about a few things, and uh, he had three main concerns to go over with her. He wanted her to change her belief in uh, Jesus-only baptism because they're baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the second thing he said is that he wanted her to abandon her flat earth beliefs. And the third thing was she needed to stop, you know, bad-mouthing them on Facebook and stuff. But then I asked him, I said, hey— on what grounds, biblically, are you asking her to denounce the flat earth? Like, how do you prove the heliocentric model with your Bible? And he looks at the elder next to him and goes, helio what? And the guy goes, it means sun-centered. <laughs> he didn't even know what the heliocentric model meant. And then he didn't have any answers, really. He goes, well, basically, um, I've never been asked to, to explain it using the Bible, but I think you guys just deny all science. And I said, hey, if you want to talk science as opposed to scripture, that's my specialty. I love to talk science with you. What scientifically proves you're on a spinning ball? And he goes, uh, 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 and he goes, you know, I'll have to get back to you on it. And I, and I could appreciate that. He was honest. He literally didn't have one argument. And he just asked Ashlyn to denounce the flat earth because he thought it was crazy and it was bad for the church. Like how crazy mm -hmm. is that? Mm -hmm. So, Well, that seems to be uh, something that is coming to light a lot in this day and age. And especially for those of us that, you know, have now looked into and examined it and have accepted the geocentric cosmology and that the Bible and other books like Enoch speak about and certainly talk about the circular movements of the sun and the moon and the other luminaries above the face of the earth. And so, uh, I mean, Psalms 19 tells you about the, the sun moving in circuit. And so, um, you know, and then even the thing with the story of Joshua and how the Most High gave him the authority over the sun and the moon to stop the sun and the moon in order to elongate the day. Well, how does that work if it's the earth that is spinning that causes the sun to go down? You know, um, certainly God would have known that if it was the earth that is moving that causes the sun to go down to give Joshua the authority over the earth and the moon. And, but we don't see that uh, in the scriptures. And then another consideration is this, the Isaiah chapter 38, the sun going back 10 degrees on the sundial. Uh, that would mean that the earth was stopped in its 1037 mile hour orbit reversed in retrograde motion and then allowed once it got back 10 degrees to continue forth in the same manner that it had previously and yet there was no cataclysmic uh you know escalation from such movement and such uh event having occurred and there's nothing in the bible as to any kind of repercussions from such action happening and so you know those kind of things in my opinion cannot be explained by the heliocentric model and so 
and these kind of things, you know, with individuals that are opening themselves to new possibility, examining and looking at it. Well, I believe that we can explain biblical events and biblical scriptures, like even how the earth existed before the sun, the moon, and stars, and how they were placed into its firmament, which was fitted and um, encapsulates the circle of the earth. Uh, those kind of things are plain in the Genesis timeline. And so, Rob, would you comment on this? And then we'll go to Robbie and Pastor Nate. Comment on uh, what specifically? Well, just about the, you know, the Genesis timeline and about how the cosmology that we accept now explains more and cl in clarity, like the Genesis timeline, the day sure. one through four through creation, and also stories like Joshua and Isaiah and others. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, you know, this is only an issue for people who claim to have the Bible as their source for truth. You know, and that would be Christians would say, you know, and even Jews, I suppose, would say, you know, they believe that their Tanakh, the Old Testament, is their source for truth. Um, you know, Christians claim that the Bible is their source for truth. Well, okay, then look at the first chapter of the first book. Is Torah right. people, Torah people are the worst. You know, they go psycho on you for all this, and and part of that is because they already are feeling heat when they went from standard evangelical, I'm just going to say pagan Christianity, and crossed over to doing the things of God and doing Bible things in Bible ways, they already took a lot of hit. You know, mm -hmm. what do you think? You're a Jew now? How come you're not eating pork anymore? Why aren't you doing Christmas with us? And, you know, so they're already taking right. all that. And then somebody like myself who b believes the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation and has a lot of material out there on, you know, the, the, the problem with the, the pagan holidays and all that stuff. So I'm, I'm perceived to be, for many people, uh, somebody uh, like a, one of the go-to guys for Torah stuff. And then they find out that I'm flat earth and they go crazy. They're like, Oh my God, what are you doing? You know? And I'm like, look, if you're going to blame anybody, blame Moses. I mean, he wrote it <laughs> first chapter. You, you read the first chapter of the, whether you're a Torah guy or a Bible, just Christian, whatever, just read the first chapter of the first book. You're not going to get a spinning heliocentric ball out of it. You, yeah, and when you see that the sun and moon don't show up until day four and they're put inside the firmament, which is a hard structure that, as we see later in Amos, is described as being attached to the earth, all of a sudden this becomes a very finite, much smaller system than, than the, uh, the view of standard cosmology, where the earth is tiny blue marble floating in a backwater galaxy in the middle of nowhere in an ever-expanding universe. You know, and when you see passages where... Uh, Joshua commands the sun to stand and the moon because right. there's some that don't want to just focus on the sun. No, no he, he says the sun and the moon. So, so if you say, well, and like I used to say this I, myself, I used to say, if my understanding of cosmos is correct, then the earth stopped rotating. Well, that may solve the problem of what the sun's doing, but it doesn't solve the problem with the moon's doing. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, right. So, <clears throat> and frankly, if, if, in the standard model, the earth stopped if the Earth stopped rotating, that would cause some major problems. The yeah, magnetic absolutely. field goes, you got a thousand mile an hour wind shear, everything goes flying off into space. I mean, you're going to have all kinds of problems. And then if you, and the moon also, that they believe can magically controls the tides, uh, I mean, you're going to have this whole, this Earth would rip apart in that scenario, right? But no, you, Joshua, in a legal system, words mean things. Everything you say can and will be used against you, right? I mean, Right. Words are very specific in a legal system. So when Joshua commanded the sun and moon to stand still, I don't see God and the angels up there going, well, what do you think he meant? Oh, I don't know. Maybe let's stop the earth. Okay, yeah, let's stop the earth. You know, that wasn't how it worked. You know, the sun and moon obeyed. The earth didn't have any part of it, you know. And it specifically says the sun and moon, not only did they stop, but they stopped directly over geographic locations. Yes. Which exactly. really only makes sense if they're about 40 miles across and, you know, less than 3,000 miles up, you know, that, that you could actually pinpoint it as being stopped over a geographical location. Again, if you're going to say you believe the Bible, and worse still, if you're going to claim that you take it literally, then you have to do so, you know. Um, right. And, and when Hezekiah make the, the sundial go backwards, well, that would have meant that the Earth stopped rotating, rotated backwards, 
and then spun back up again the right way to, to 1,000 miles an hour. <laughs> There's no indication of any of that anywhere in the text. And like, like you uh, said, you know, with regard to the book of Enoch, I mean, you know, people argue whether or not we should consider it scripture. I don't, I don't need to go there. Uh, it, I personally think that it should be considered scripture. I think people in the first century, certainly in you know, the first couple of centuries, certainly did. Um, the authors of scripture did. The Ethiopians still do to this day, and as do others. So whatever the case may be, it seems to be an authoritative text that the biblical authors were very, very well aware of. And that book just tells you point blank. I think it's chapter 89 that talks about a lofty roof that had seven torrents of water coming in, you know, for the vision of the coming flood, filling up that enclosure. And it uses the right. phrase enclosure, that enclosure five times in that one passage. It's describing a Truman Show style snow globe type of system, you know, within which Genesis 1 says, Moses says, the sun, moon, and stars were placed inside of this hard structure on day four of creation. And of course, you've unpacked this uh, significantly in your book, Flat Earth is Key to Decrypting the Book of Enoch, uh, showing how we're dealing with a very uh, complex clock. And those are the hands moving ab above the circular face of that clock that we call the Earth. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Robbie, I'd like to pose to you the same question as far as, you know, um, understanding the Bible. And then because all of us have. Sure since we've learned this, revisited all of those passages and reconsidered them. Yeah, I think it comes down to this major war with scientism. And what we're dealing with when we're getting into Bible literalism is you have basically the two proof texts that, you know, we used even before. I know Rob did, I did, you know, Isaiah 40, 22, right? The reality right. is this, that if every verse supporting creation uh, encompassed their worldview, it would all be literal. But here's what, what's happening is they'll take Isaiah 40, 22, and they'll say, see, literally, it's talking about the globe. And then they'll bring up Job 26, 7. See, literally, it's talking about the globe. You're telling me there's two literal verses about creation, and, and the rest of the 273 <laughs> verses are all poetic and allegory? Are you kidding me? This is madness, right? right this is absolute right. madness. That you're, you know, and I say to people all the time, listen, if you're going to tell me that all the like, 250 verses that I'm bringing up are allegory, you can't even use those two. How dare you? I mean, talk about hypocritical. Right. The reality is right. this. It doesn't jive with the scientism narrative. And this is the deadly. The reality is that scientism is so entrenched, not just in the in the world, the secular worldview, but also in the church. And again, we can get into, you know, these topics, but that's why it's so incredibly important is because they don't even realize what they're fighting for. They've been they have been supporting science and the Bible for so long. You know, you remember all those like those books that we were all excited about because science confirmed the Bible. Bible over and over and over again, right? This is like a Trojan horse coming in where all of a sudden we got propped up. We got happier and happier. It was almost like, how much evidence do we need? How, how much does Thomas need to actually touch Jesus to believe, right? right? And again, there's that mentality that people have. And it's like, how much do you need? But again, we got excited. We got so excited because science was the validator that came along and said, science validates this and science validates that. We got all excited. The reality is this, that they're going against the narrative because it doesn't fit the scientism mainstream and Dr nation that's been put in place by Satan from a very early age to completely take out the credibility of the Bible in every single way. Again, we see it time and time again with every single verse. And my case in point is you're going to hold on to two verses that are literal, which really, I mean, they're kind of blurry at best, right? They can go either way. I mean, talking about a circle, I mean, we've got into, you know, looking at the dichotomy between a, you know, a ball and a circle and all that. But what I'm right. saying is how hypocritical it is, you know, but again, to me, it's not just just that I get upset about it. It's also, I want to pray. I also feel sadness because again, I was there myself, right? That's why I don't take the spiritual high ground on this. I don't know why God chose to wake me up or other people. And I'm not saying, oh, we're special. We've been basically called to carry this message. It's so incredibly important. And we have a task and we have such a huge responsibility on our hands. And, you know, I see things happening here and there and it gets discouraging because I'm like, look, if we only understood how important, how critical this truth is to the entire world, to the lost world, you know, yes. Rob brought up, I, I get testimonies. I mean, I'm sure we all can talk about all the amazing, wonderful fruit that is coming from this. And God is truly calling people back to him through creation. So it is incredibly important. And I see it as an absolute danger where people would rather bring up science and NASA rather than saying, here's from the word of God. We're basically holding on to the literal word of God. And honestly, if my tombstone, you know, I, that's all I'm known for is this guy just stood on. He was a Bible literalist. Great. You know what? 
that I think I believe is what the father is calling and in these end times and getting closer, you know, I think this is what's happening. But again, this is spiritual. We have been woken up for a reason. That's why we can't boast. It's almost like salvation, you know, that no man may boast. That's why we cannot be boastful. We've got to be humble with this. We have to understand that we've been given this responsibility. We've been given this calling. And with this calling, just like Robin brought up, you know, Joseph, what a, what a tremendous story that is. I mean, honestly, the, the, the crap that he went through and the mercy and forgiveness that he showed, I mean, only yes, by God's right. strength could I actually have that. But that is one of the most powerful stories in the Bible for me. Joseph is one of the most remarkable stories for me personally uh, of just, again, like Rob said, all this evil and all this stuff was coming against them. You know, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And, and our journey is yes. going forward and standing on the word of God. Absolutely, man. It's going to be a rough road. And that's why we have to come together. We need each other, brothers. We need prayer. We need that support. But also, I believe the rewards are huge because, again, if one person comes back to the Father and understands the true creator of creation through this whole thing and the saving knowledge of the Messiah, Jesus, again, it's all worth it. So it's just one person. I don't need a basket of, you know, thousands of people. I'm just saying that this is happening and this is exactly what is going on. And God truly is waking up the world to the truth about his true creation. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a beautiful thing. I mean, because even militant, hardcore atheist agnostics that wouldn't even consider um, the a belief in a creator or anything to do with any kind of religion or Christianity or faith or anything like that. I mean, it's forcing them to have to turn everything around uh, and to accept that. And then that brings them a step closer and closer. Once they understand the inspired nature of the gospel, then, you know, studying and reading it for themselves, that brings them to uh, understand the Savior Messiah and that salvation is through him. And so that's the most important thing. Uh, but Pastor Nate, I wanted to ask you also, brother, um, 20 years you've been dedicated to studying, teaching the word of God. And I mean, could you, I know you wouldn't, but uh, as far as going back, I mean, and being quiet on this subject, I know you've made a, a point to stand on this truth and God bless you for doing that. But can you talk about just the struggle? Cause I, I know it, it has to weigh on your mind. I mean, especially with you putting up your whole livelihood, you have multiple kids, you have family to take care of, uh, of what it was like for you to have to kind of go through that to, you know, wrestle with yourself and your conscience to really stand on this truth and to make it, uh, the decision for your life going forward. Sure. Yeah. It, I mean, it was a, a challenge and, um, you know, I want people to be absolutely understanding. This was a very traumatic situation for not only for myself, but for my wife and for my kids, you know, when I got fired, it essentially alienated my entire family from the church. And, uh, so it wasn't without a lot of, uh, you know, tears and prayer and just, you know, struggle and relying on the encouragement from others, people who were messaging us and praying for us. Um, you know, the struggle, the struggle is real. It's not an easy thing. And, you know, I have, uh, I do have four children. Uh, one is uh, a young adult who lives with us uh, and is working. Uh, one is a college student, and uh, he's he's enrolled at a at a private Christian college. So, you know, it's it's not a cheap place for him to be. But he was already, you know, beginning his semester and uh, really enjoying the spiritual environment there. And so, you know, that's a that's a a big challenge. And on my younger two are bo both in high school, so you know they're only a couple of years away from being graduated. And so the timing of it was very challenging, you know, for my my family emotionally, um, financially. And, you know, I was making a, a decent income. Um, you know, I was getting a salary of about sixty thousand dollars per year. And so when that is is stopped, you know, when the rug is pulled out from under you suddenly, you know, it wasn't like something we saw happening. And things were going well with the church, and I had been there for seven years. So uh, this was totally unexpected, um, you know, for the reasons that they stated. And uh, so, you know, you go from having a family of six and your income is halved, you know, just out of the blue. 
so yeah, there's the there's the financial uh, challenge uh, as well. And, you know, that's why we've really had to rely on the providence of God, and we've had to stay in prayer. And uh, really how God has blessed us is through people whose hearts, you know, have been open to, you know, considering supporting me in this new ministry. And uh, we're, we're praying for more people uh, to help us with that because, uh, you know, right now, uh, the end of December, you know, we'll have all of our bills paid for December, but January and February are going to be some, some times of testing for us, uh, because my, you know, our, our reserves are running out, (laughs) but you know, it's, it's more so I think the, um, the struggle of, you know, what is true and you, it's, it's like, you know, Jeremiah talks about this fire in your bones, you know, um, one of two things was going to happen, even if even if the church was patient with me, if if they had been willing to sit down with me and study this out and then decided, I'm sorry, we can't, we don't agree and we can't let you teach this, eventually I would have had to leave or they would have had to fire me because I would have been preaching what I believe was the truth. But I think there's that tension there. And, uh, you know, it is a struggle, and there's the spiritual, you know, element, as Nathan mentioned earlier, there's a there's a huge spiritual element to this. Um, and so, you know, so now I'm thinking, you know, how do I, how do I reach out to people? You know, how do I engage with people uh, and even believers? And I just wanted to throw this in in the whole biblical creation, you know, discussion. Uh, I, my, my big thing is to try to get people, you know, would you be willing to just look at Genesis chapter one with me? Uh, you know, yes, there's Mm -hmm. 200 plus, you know, verses and some, some people have said, no man, there's like a thousand, but I try to just say, Hey, you know, the test of where their heart is at is, would you be willing to sit down with me just to look at Genesis one? Because, you know, when we look at Genesis one verses nine and 10, you know, it talks about the waters being gathered, uh, you know, together into one place and the dry land appears. That's on day three. You know, it's not until day four when God says, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven. Uh, and, you know, he says he makes the two great lights and the stars also. And so for me, if if someone can look at that and not uh, say, whoa, wait a second, you know, that totally contradicts the heliocentric model. If they're not willing then um, to look into it further, then you know that their hearts aren't open. Uh, but it's a tough road, as, as all of you know. It's All of us have had a tough road starting out, uh, and uh, we have to stay in fervent prayer because that's what's really, that's what's really going to help us to continue to understand truth, to be able to discern error, and uh, you know, praying for opportunity and testimonies. Uh, and I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I want to just say real quick, uh, my son had an experience with his boss a few weeks ago. Somehow they got on the topic of, of conspiracy theories and flat earth was brought up and the guy says, well, you know, I kind of dabbled in it, but he said, I never really got convinced. Well, my son told him about my YouTube channel, uh, and he went and watched some videos, uh, some biblical creation videos. And he came back to my son a week or two ago and said, man, he says, I, I watched those videos. You know, things were very plain. I, I looked it up. You know, mm-hmm. your dad your dad just basically preached what the Bible said. And he got convicted. And he says, I am now 100% convinced that <laughs> right. the earth is flat. But even greater than that, last week, um, because at the end of my videos, I typically put, uh, you know, a gospel message, a call to action of sorts at the end. And uh, he had believed in Jesus, but he really was not uh, firm in his faith. He had never really made that commitment, repented of his sins, you know, obeyed the gospel. And something in that, you know, five minutes at the end of my video pricked his heart. And he's telling my son now that he wants to be obedient to God and that he is uh, wanting to repent uh, and probably be baptized very soon. So that's very, very exciting. Uh, mm-hmm. To me, that's the providence of God working in this. So, and that only comes through prayer, um, and of course through the will of God. Yeah, praise God. Um, and uh, Pastor Nate, really quick, uh, can you share your Patreon um, 
account so that people sure. can help support yeah. you in this time? Yeah, if uh, if <laughs> folks would like to support me, even with a small amount monthly, they can go to patreon.com forward slash Nate Wolf. And also all my videos, uh, late, later videos, I've been putting a PayPal direct link and a P.O. box because some folks uh, have said, well, you know, I'd like to do, you know, do it differently. And so I've added those options just because people brought it up and said, hey, you know, do you have a PayPal link? Hey, do you have a P.O. box? I don't I don't like to do online transactions. But uh, Patreon is honestly uh, the best way for me because it gives me some monthly support that I can kind of budget off of. But, uh, so yeah, I appreciate that. Any, any support, but certainly the prayers, everyone can pray. And that's definitely what I need right now. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, thank you in advance. Those of you that do support pastor Nate and also, um, Nathan, can you talk a little bit about your troubles in coming forth and bringing forth this truth and how it was that you were, you know, with your job, um, and and share that with the listening community, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, of course. Um, so I remember the usual, um, friends mocked it and ridiculed it. And my parents, I remember they looked at me when I told them that I thought the earth was flat. They looked at me like I had just told them I killed somebody. (laughs) <laughs> uh, like that was literally the look on their face. Oh my I, so I, rem- I remember them like being infuriated almost. That's what I got from them. And so, um, and then at starting the group, the official flat earth and globe discussion, I just added all my friends as many as I could until Facebook would ban me. And then I'd get off being banned a week later or two weeks later and add 400, 300 more friends. Um, and so that's how the group got started. And so uh, yeah, you know, I've dealt with all that ridicule because I lit- every single person I come across here in Houston, I've shared it with. And uh, I was sharing Flat Earth all over the U.S. and working for a company called Legal Shield. It's an app company. Um, Rob Skeeb has actually been a member for about 10 years. And his uh, his wife said she was going to write in and say this is a serious injustice because this is what happened real quick. I was sharing Flat Earth on a paid vacation. It was not an event. We were not having... Um, you know, anything going on at the amusement park, we were we were paid to go have fun. And so I was there sharing Flat Earth with people and people were being very receptive and we were having a good time. We met some Flat Earthers there um, and then we got asked to leave by security. And then when we got to our hotel, we got kicked out of the hotel room, which was already prepaid by the company. And the next day, uh, no questions asked, um, no warning. I got a termination email. So over about 100 associates on my downline were all um, terminated from any connection with me. And then also I lost all my residual income from memberships that I had personally sold. And so it wasn't like a nine to five job that I had with them. I was building a business. It was a franchise, like similar to like a McDonald's, but I just didn't have a brick and mortar type building system. Um, and so they took all that away from me, no questions asked. And then I was pleading with them to let me back. And they said I had to abandon my beliefs in flat earth to even be considered let back. And those are the words of Jeff Bell, the CEO of Legal Shield. That's a half a billion dollar company. Um, and I, that was a few years ago. I don't even know what they do in sales now. But so all these associates are out working for a company that literally no questions asked. Uh, just because I was out sharing my beliefs in public and got asked to leave a hotel, they terminated my entire business. And so pleaded with them for months. And then finally they said they'd let me back Zen. And uh, I asked how long it would take. And they said a few weeks or a few months. And a few months went by. We wrote in. A couple of us wrote in uh, letters to the company. And they said that they weren't even considering it. And still to this day, they've actually, the only letter they wrote me was saying that I need to stop talking about it. They demand that I stop talking about it. And I just, I won't stop talking about it because in my opinion, it's a grave injustice. I mean, uh, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Everywhere. So, like, uh, anytime someone does something seriously wrong like that, because, guys, that's not like, uh, you know, McDonald's or Boeing or anything. That's Legal Shield claiming they protect people's rights and freedom of speech isn't a right and freedom of, you know, scientific belief in, in biblical cosmology. That isn't a right that we have. And, and really, I think that they're just kind of like, you know, poking the bear with this because they have a lot of Christians in their company. And once all those really good people realize that they did something 
they that you know and, and maybe I should have been sharing it on a company trip. You know, or you know, but they I could have I, I apologized. I told them I wouldn't do it anymore, and still they they lied to me, told me they were gonna let me back, and then never did, and like demanded I abandon my beliefs and stuff. And I'm going from a legal shield company that protects people's rights is so wrong on so many levels. Um, and I just I appreciate you asking about it because like I don't want to stop talking about it. Um, but like you know how the way I always share flat Earth guys. And this is just a little tip uh, is, is like lovingly. And the Bible says love is patient and kind. It's not jealous, boastful, proud or rude. So like when I was sharing this with people at Universal Studios, like I wasn't shoving it in their face. Like I wasn't uh, cursing at them or or like being rude, um, you know, and we were having fun. It was that's what we do for fun is talk about flat earth. So like if they don't want me to talk about flat earth, even though that's what I do for fun, like they need to tell me that. And not just terminate my entire business because I got asked to leave. So that's what happened. And uh, since then, guys, been you know people have been hooking me up with jobs, and people have been sending me some PayPal's. And uh, I got uh, Sean Powell insisted I start a Patreon, so I got all that Patreon forward slash Nathan Thompson. My PayPal is my email NathanPPL at yahoo.com. And like, go support Nate Wolf, or if you listen to Rob, please go support Rob Skiba. Uh, he's one of my mentors, like an honor speaking on just a chat with you, but speaking after you at the conference um, and Robbie Davidson, man, you're a freaking hero. So I just appreciate all you. If, if these if you follow these guys, support them. Um, so, yeah, that was my story, Zen, about Legal Shield. Um, and and it's all good because God has bigger plans for like anyone doing his will. Um, and he says that, you know, so. Absolutely. Amen. And uh, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because I want to ask the listening audience to also support Nathan Thompson because um, he's been homeless, basically, and living out of his car and going, you know, from different flat earther to different flat earther and crashing on people's uh, in the kindness of their hearts, you know, opening and extending them um, their house to him. And so uh, please do, you know, both of these guys till they can get. Uh, hooked up because I know the most high is going to bless them and for them standing with truth and for their decision to to stand on the truth of God's word that he's going to take care of them and he's going to bless them but in the interim until they get settled and stable and back on their feet I I do ask the listening audience uh, to please support both of them and uh, know that you know we all appreciate you doing so and that we all should stand for each other in the best way that we can but um uh rob i just wanted to give you a chance brother because i know that you also went through a trying time uh where you know coming forth on all this that it, it was difficult and it's only been now that really that um even recently that the blessings have been uh, pouring on you and you've been able to kind of get stable and to uh, change uh, some of the aspects of life and stuff but uh just if you would just mention a little bit more uh, about the the difficulty um because you know a lot of people say that you and i especially that we're doing this just to sell books which is so far far from the truth i mean if we wanted to sell books you know flat earth when less than one percent of the population even believe in this topic that's certainly not the way to go and then the whole ridicule thing uh just about how it was that you were able to you know get yourself back up because you there was a time when you wanted to shut down all your websites and just disconnect from this issue and um you know kind of what regained your strength and your resolve with this and coming back into the movement for sure yeah thank you <clears throat> well like i said earlier I, you know i'd already been on the speaking circuit and it took you know a number of years and anybody that just comes from complete obscurity uh nobody knows you exist except for your few friends and family right and you put something out there well that doesn't automatically mean everybody's going to buy it or see it or you know even acknowledge that you exist right you have to really work hard if you if you write a book first of all writing a book is a lot of work to begin with mm -hmm. uh then after you write a book that's not even half the battle the rest of the battle is getting the word out that you have a book make people aware of it so they'll buy it you know um but i want to address something because you know one of the issues that always comes up is you guys are just doing it for the money i'm like well then you need to explain why everything 
all of my content is online for free. Right. The, the books and DVDs that I have for sale are derived, like directly derived from the online content. All of my books started out as blogs that are still online. People can read them for free. And the video is the same thing. They, you know, I put them on YouTube and I put them on a DVD. So people buy my product because they want to, not because it's their only option. So that's the first thing I want to address. All of my content's online for free. Buy it if you want it. Um, but when we first got started, and you know, it, it took a lot of work to get the word out that we have a book in print and some DVDs out there. Um, and and you, you, they always say you got to have the elevator speech, right? Well, that was absolutely true. I, I happened to get into an elevator with Gary Stearman from Prophecy of the News, and I just so happened to have a couple of DVDs in my pocket, and I had like two minutes for whatever you know, the ground floor to whatever floor we went up in the ho hotel. And I gave him my elevator speech and handed him the DVDs. Well, you know, it was about three weeks later, he had finally watched them and contacted me and said, you know, I'd like to get you on the show. I got on the show and boom, you know, that, that, you know, you get in a platform like that with that many followers, all of a sudden you're on the radar, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then as I started going to the popular uh, prophecy conferences and stuff and speaking on stage with people like Tom Horn and L.A. Marzulli and other, these other big name guys, you know, I started to get recognized. So, but it took a while. I mean, from 2000, well, really from 2010 to about 2014, those four years, it was a lot of work just trying to get the word out and finally getting to the point because I left. I was literally called out of a full time, good paying job. We were making my wife and I together were making six figures plus full benefits, traveling the world. Amazing job. But God literally called us out. said, I want you to do basically what I'm doing now. So we took a step out in faith. But you step out from that to nothing. There's there's the ideas scribbled on napkins. There's nothing there. You know, but that's often the faith walk that we are called to step out. And I think Nate's experiencing that now. Um, several of us, probably maybe even all of us on this call are, have experienced it to one degree or another. You step out in faith and, you know, it's like Indiana Jones in the, the third movie where he's told to take a leap of faith right over this chasm to go get the Holy Grail. And he's like, <laughs> I, can't, I can't jump over that, you know, but he, he he's believed in every part of the prophecy that he was following you know, the, the code that he was following so far paid off. So he's like, takes a step out over the abyss and lands on an invisible platform that carried him across. Well, I mean, that's a great allegory for what many of us have done, you know, taking that step out. And, you know, when we did that in 2010, it was a massive leap of faith, you know, to leave behind all the security that we had, you know, in, in the job situation uh, and then work real, real hard, real, real hard. Finally got to the place where our bills were getting paid on time and, you know, things are fairly consistent. Sales are coming. Stuff's good. Got into flat earth and, oh, my gosh, like everything just <laughs> tanked because, you know, all of the people who liked my other research, all of a sudden you could even look at the Amazon reviews. People are like uh, commenting my other books have nothing to do with flat earth. But they're like, yeah, you know, I thought he was pretty cool. Then I see this guy believes the earth's flat. So how smart could he be? Right. <laughs> so all of a sudden, like all of our sales just dried up and I had eight hundred dollars in the bank and no promise of any future income. Meanwhile, I've got sciatica. My back is like killing me. I can barely move. My my father-in-law is dying in our living room on hospice. Uh, it was a rough, rough season when we when we first got into Flat Earth, April of 2015. And by August, you know, her dad's taking, uh, uh, my, Sheila's dad's taking a turn for the worse. I can't barely move. And we got no money in the bank. And I'm like, screw this. I put Phil Collins up on every page of my Test and Globe website. I don't care anymore. The song, I don't care anymore. Because uh, that's where I was. But it was an atheist that turned everything around. An atheist wrote to me, no longer an atheist, shared his testimony, and then gave a firm but polite rebuke. Like, how dare you? You know, this stuff is needed. It saved my life, you know, eternally. And he's like, how dare you? You know, do you believe what you're saying or not? And... Um, you know, meanwhile, my father-in-law, before he took his final turn, when he, when he was still coherent enough to speak, one of the last things I remember him saying to me was, Rob, you got to stop this. It's going to destroy your ministry. And I'm like, Pappy, I can't. I can't stop this. I, I, the Bible says it. i got to take a stand on it. You know, um, but our financial problems, the, the worst of it was when I was not committing. I was saying the Bible says it, but I wasn't committing to it. You know, I was straddling the fence, calling myself a zetetic agnostic on the issue. 
And, uh, you know, Sheila, she called me out on it. You know, she's like, Bible says it, I believe it. Boom. What's, what's the problem? You know, she's like, you, you, you'd make such a great case showing everybody this is what the Bible says. You, you yourself, you won't commit to it. And I'm like, I know, but I'm, I'm sitting on the scripture, prove all things, right? Test all things. So hence testing the globe. I'm trying to prove it. Right. But after the Lake Michigan test, and we did see a lot of things that scientifically, at least in my mind, made a good case for flat earth. Uh, it finally just ultimately became a surrender of faith and saying, you know what, God, I, I, you know, come hell or high water. I know what your word says. Your word has never let me down. All this other stuff is based on monkey man science and atheists and Nazis and Freemasons and you name it, occultists. I'm just going to take a stand. And it was that that moment that uh, everything changed for us, you know, unsolicited. I didn't tell anybody that we were on the verge of bankruptcy. I did. We did put a note out cause we needed $10,000 to bury my father-in-law. We had no money for his funeral or to bury him. I mean, it costs a lot of money to bury somebody, you know? So we did put a word out on that and the community got together and brought in the money and we were able to bury Sheila's father. Um, but then other just letters of encouragement and checks started to come in and, you know, I just want to thank the listening audience out there, anybody who was part of that, for listening to the Holy Spirit. I wasn't out there saying I needed the money, even though I really did. Uh, people were just being sensitive. The Holy Spirit was putting on their heart, hey, you know what, you should, if you benefited from this material that Rob's put out, you know, maybe you should uh, let them know about it. And um, they were. And, you know, I just want to encourage Nate, too, you know, in, in this faith walk, he will try you. He will test you. Are you still going to believe me? And, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but for me, every time I've done this, the beginning is really, really tough. Like the first couple of years is really tough. Um, but then as faith builds upon faith and you start to see his consistency where every month you may just have only enough to pay the bills that you have, keep the roof on, the lights on and the food on your table. That may be all you have. You have no money left over. Um, but each month of that happening your faith is building, it's getting stronger and you're becoming more bolder and more empowered by it. And you learn to trust him. And, you know, I, I still struggle like anybody else wondering, okay, what's going to happen next month? You know? Um, but now at this point in, in our ministry, I've, uh, I have no reason not to trust him. Uh, so even though I don't always know what's coming in and I don't, there's no consistency to it. Uh, he, father's faithful. And so, you know, that's that's the way it worked out for me. Yeah, Amen. for me as well. Um, Robbie, if you would, brother, can you tell people just a little bit about your book? Uh, and then I want to end with why it is that you think this topic is important, especially for this generation. Sure. Well, I put out my book, uh, Scientism Exposed, and it's based actually on uh, my two documentary films, Scientism Exposed and Scientism Exposed 2. So most people, you know, make movies out of the book. I actually did the reverse. So I actually wrote the book after putting out the documentaries. And really the book is just a, a combination of just all the research putting together. But really what was on my heart, because even before that, in um, you know 2015, I put out The Global Lie, which was right direct in your face, flat earth. Scientism Exposed, however, was more for a resource than a tool because the first, uh, you know, documentary doesn't even mention Flat Earth. And so I would start with just, you know, evolution and getting into, you know, monkey man science and then start just branching off into some other areas and getting people to question. So really, you know, uh, I would say that Scientism Exposed, while I'm sure anyone that's on board with this topic will get a lot from it, it's also a great resource uh, to give to someone because, like I said, I don't think until the eighth chapter it gets into uh, the shape of the Earth. So it really touches on kind of more of the, um, you know, diabolical levels of, of scientism throughout the ages, the connections with the occult and, and all these type of things, especially for the Christian. But even for the non-Christian, it really points to the true creator of creation, which, you know, in my opinion, obviously is the most important when it comes to this topic, because we can talk all we want about what, how is the creation? How does it look? How does it act? You know, what shape is it? But if we really forget the creator, we're missing the point. The whole point is, and a lot of people right now, even in the community, are really focused on on the, the creation, which is, is great and all. But again, if they really miss the boat on really seeking the true creator, uh, again, that's what he's calling these people to do, it's giving them a hunger for truth. But really, the truth is found in, in only one, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So really, it's, it's a call to him 
which the Bible says that he is the creator. I mean, it's one thing when you say a creator or you say God, you know, God of the Bible. But when you actually say in the Messiah, Jesus was the creator, which is said, you know, in the New Testament, it really turns heads. It really changes things. What? Jesus, the guy that, you know, was in a manger, the one that, you know, died on the cross. He's the creator. How does this work? But again, that's the mystery. That's the important thing is who is this guy named Jesus? You know, um, he set before us a really, really important thing to look at. You know, and for me, it was really I think C.S. Lewis quoted it like either he's a lunatic, he's a liar or he's Lord. He didn't open it up to say that he's just a good teacher or he's a prophet. I mean, he claims some incredible, credible things. So unless he actually fulfilled those and he came through. And it's interesting to me that people, you know, won't debate Julius Caesar. I mean, everyone, everyone agrees that Julius Caesar existed. And yet the manuscripts, there's hardly any. And they exist like thousands of years after, you know, he was alive. Yet the earliest manuscripts, you know, on Jesus are like 30 years or 40 years. Right. But it's, it's unbelievable to me how many people will dispute, you know, when it comes to this one person, Jesus. Right. And that is really where it all comes down to is when the Bible is very, very clear. So while this pursuit and understanding and unveiling and exposing the world's lies is incredibly important, again, if it doesn't lead us to the truth and the true creator, we're missing it all. And again, that's what my ministry, I think everyone on this panel would agree, this is what is the most important. And God is calling us to actually bring that light to people and to show them that while, while they have been exposed to many, many lies, and while that can be depressing and discouraging, there is a hope, there is a joy, there is a there is a freedom. And honestly, when it comes down to it, there is the freedom. You know, truth will set you free and it truly does set you free. It can be a rough road for sure. But like, you know, Rob had brought up earlier in the in the uh, program, you know, talking about, uh, you know, Joseph. And he's just one example. But again, the roads that God called these men to do were incredibly painful, incredibly, you know, tough uh, again. But Rob brought it up as well, too, that, you know, when he relies on the father, and again, that is what's important is relying on the father through all of this. And when you do have that, you can basically face anything if you're basically relying on his strength and, and his will for your life. Amen. I fully agree. I um, want to give you each chance uh, for final comment, just a, a couple minutes, uh, maybe three minutes each, if you, if you can. Uh, Nathan, we'll go to you first. Are you there, brother? Yeah, I'm here. I'm guessing I'm Nathan and the other one's Nate. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Great. Cool. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you were asking why it matters um, and, yeah. and why we're passionate about it. Uh, well, real quick, I'll, I'll start with my story is uh, I was about 10 or 12 years old and um, I was starting to try and put my worldview together. And my friends were telling me there's a God that loves me and the school's telling me I'm on a spinning ball in space. And I remember just looking up at the sky and saying, hey, God, if you were real and you did love me, then you wouldn't put billions of light years of space between me and you. You wouldn't be this unfamiliar, like distant God. Um, and, and it was actually cosmology that caused me to be an atheist for about eight more years until I started researching prophecy and mm -hmm. um, all the coding in the Bible and numerology and the equidistant letter sequencing. And I was just like. Because I'm not, I've never been one of those firm believers. I've always been someone who needs the proof. And I, I had to go prove the Bible to myself. And then once I heard the cosmology was in question and people were still you know, researching flat earth and uh, I took an honest look at it. Um, Hendry says an honest man um, who is proven to be wrong must either admit he's wrong or he's no longer an honest man. And so once I realized I was wrong about cosmology, and that all my friends and all my family were being deceived on a massive level about where they live. Uh, it lit a huge fire under, under my rear to tell people. But also, I'm so thankful for this opportunity that the Most High has given us because we can store so much treasure in heaven because, like, really, 90% of people just mock and ridicule flat earth. But it is the truth, and it is God's creation. And mm -hmm. he starts his word with creation. So... I think it's important to him and it should be important to us also. And like um, heliocentricity is the seminal scientific deception from which all other scientific deceptions are flowing. So yeah. this is the, the key to the matrix that's going to unlock the evolution nonsense and the global warming scam and the vaccines that they're poisoning all the kids with and all the fake history that they're teaching people about the wars 
and who the real terrorists are. Um, and so all that, all that good stuff, man, all comes from flat earth. So if you're getting slack for it, who cares? Um, just hit me up, get some flyers, uh, Nathan PPL at yahoo.com. Also, uh, shout out to everyone on this chat, man. You're all legends in my book. I love you guys. Um, so thanks for having me on Zen. So yeah, it's our great honor, man. We appreciate your work as well. Rob, Rob, are you there, brother? Sorry, I'm sitting there talking away with the same thing. I didn't mute it. Sorry. <laughs> You're good. Yeah, I, I mean, I would echo everything that uh, Nathan just said. But, you know, I mean, we have good reason to believe that that, that our timeline's running out. You know, um, th this, uh, this story is coming to an end, and there's a new one that's going to be written at some point. Um, and But when you look at the ending of the story, it gets real bad, man. And there's a massive deception that many people, even the elect, could be deceived by. And, you know, that's why, you know, I take a look at this and say, at the 21st century of all time, really, we're talking about this of all things? Well, and maybe there's a reason for it. And it is my personal opinion that whatever is coming, it, then I have a very strong suspicion that it's going to have to do with uh, this whole concept of ancient aliens and this yeah. disclosure and UFOs and beings coming and saying, hey, guess what? You know, yeah, Jesus, he was one of us. Yeah, he's one of our guys. Check out the holograms. You want to see the passion? You know, Mel, Mel Gibson did a good job. I could show it to you in 3D and stand there like you were actually there. Check it out. He was one of us. You know, whatever. That there is there is a massive deception that the scriptures talk about. And when I consider the source of the, the origin of most of modern science, you always find yourself dealing with atheist, agnostic, you know, monkey man science that uh, uh, organizations founded by Freemasons and Nazis and occultists out, you know, doing ceremonial sex magic, you know, out there. Uh, you know, when I look at those people and the source of, of these organizations, the, orig the origin of these organizations, I, I, I have to say, why, as a Bible believing Christian, why on earth would I can? What I look at any of that as my source for truth, especially right. when we can dem demonstrate and show that they've lied to us. We can show you pictures of the earth pasted on a graphic, you know, beefing up the contrast from the, the photos and, you know, all kinds of stuff, showing that the stuff that they're trying to pass off with $50 million a day of our money that they're robbing from us that is fraudulent. I mean, th that alone should get people fired up. Wait a minute. This company is taking $50 million of our tax money. And they're lying to us. That alone should be a huge issue for people to to want to take notice of. But you know, for me as a Bible believing Christian, what, whatever's coming, I have only one compass in a sea of lies, and it's the Word of God. So I, you know, that's why it's most important to me. That's what it says. So that's what I'm going to believe. Amen. Yeah. Pastor Nate, uh, we've got just like a minute and a half remaining. Okay, I'll make it quick. So Colossians chapter one. Verse 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So why is uh, flat earth or biblical creation important? Because for many, many people, it is the gateway for them to understand that that scripture is true and God is real and he's a lot closer than we've been told and lied to about. And also because Acts chapter 4 is clear, verse 12, that there is salvation and no other name under heaven. And so we must be saved through Jesus Christ. And I know of two people personally that fit into that category. And so I'm thankful that God allowed me to both hear testimony and plant uh, plant seed and see it uh, begin to take fruit because that uh, tells us that these two subjects are connected for many, many people. Thank you, brothers. I appreciate all of you. God bless all. Good night. Later, Zen. Thanks, guys. Later, guys. Later, later. Take care. Much love. Later, Robbie. Later, Rob. Later, man. Later, Nate. Shalom, guys. God bless all. Good night.
Christian Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. 